So Lord, please, we ask you that you would turn our hearts to you, turn the focus of our attention, our minds upon you, make us alert to your presence here. Work in us, O Lord, that which you desire. Speak to us, Lord. Your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I told the story at the 8 o'clock service that this is a rather interesting moment for me. Interesting because I found out just yesterday, actually, that in 1959, my father-in-law, was a parishioner at Christ the King in Orlando, and he and one of his fellow lay readers were invited here to preach and preside at um, morning prayer in the absence of a priest. And so my father-in-law's friend, the fellow leader, lay reader, presided at morning prayer, and my father-in-law, Harold Williams, stood in this pulpit and preached a sermon. As they say, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> so it's wonderful to be here. And I also have another connection. When I was in the diocese some 20 years ago, the rector who was here was, of course, uh, Father Bob Ray. And um, the oil stock, the oil container that I'll be using at confirmation was a gift from him. And so it's really wonderful to be here for all sorts of reasons not the least of which was enjoying Ed and Phyllis's company last night, along with Senior Warden and wife and others who came and we had a great dinner together. And it's really been just, it's been great to be here. And of course, I was treated to the gorgeous light show that is downtown Mount Nora last night. It's really quite stunning. I said to them, as someone who used to live in New York City, I don't think Rockefeller Center has anything on downtown New York. <laughs> as great as that is. I also want you to know that I come this morning, as I'm sure is true for many of you, with this sort of mixture of, on the one hand, this deep kind of hurt over what happened in Connecticut, and yet I'm here to worship. That there is, in fact, this agony that is a part of what we now face. I mean, if you think about it, I don't know what it's like for you, but it, it brought back very, very fresh memories for me. My wife and I have five sons. We remember going to the elementary school and picking them up and seeing them home on the bus and never ever anticipating anything like that. And, and so it's, it doesn't surprise me that particularly people that I know with children that age, you know, after they heard the news came and held them a little tighter than they had. I'm just incredibly grateful. It, it, is, a, it is just an unspeakable horror show. And the worst of it is that at least in this country, uh, since Columbine, we've seen more and more irregularity with these kinds of shootings. And this is, in fact, normal life in plenty of places on this planet. Um, it's, to me, a kind of tragedy that we are now thinking about a sort of new normal where this kind of seemingly unprovoked gunfire on the innocent becomes a part of what shows up in our newspapers. And so it is hard, is it not? I mean, come on, let's get real. For you to hear in the light of that, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. And this sort of very upbeat theme that rolls through the lessons, um, appropriate for Pink Candle, what is known as Gaudette Sunday. And it's meant to be a time when Advent was instituted that in the midst of all of the kind of disciplines that we actually now more think of as Lenten, fasting disciplines and the like, happened that we would have one Sunday as a kind of <sighs> relief. We could kick up our heels, we could eat chocolate, we could have a great time before we dive back into the penitential season of Advent, Advent before Christmas. And so it, it feels like some sort of disconnect, does it not? to think about what it is that we are enduring as a nation right now, and in the midst of all of that, to hear the call to rejoicing and to be rejoiced over, that is the theme of the lessons. Until we realize that, for example, in both Zephaniah's letter, as well as Paul's letter to the Philippians, 
They are both writing to people who know something of serious violence. You see, Zephaniah, as a prophet, writes the word of God to a group of people who are under the thumb of a foreign dictator, who knows something about unprovoked violence, murder, confiscation of property. Because you see, if you're an occupying government in the midst of a territory, you can pretty much do whatever you want to your citizens. In other words, our scriptures do are not shielded from the violence that, in fact, we, even though we hate it, are, in fact, beginning to get used to as a country. As awful as that even sounds for me to say such a thing. And so what Zephaniah is doing is that he is calling them to think about something larger than their circumstances and calling them to rejoice. And what he's saying to them is, the kind of terrible tyranny that you are presently experiencing is not how it will always be. You see, when he says to them, the Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has turned away your enemies. If they, if they read this and they think about what they're looking at, they'd say, well, I haven't seen any soldiers leave. It's just as bad as it was yesterday. So what do you mean the Lord has turned away your enemies? They haven't left yet. He is saying something to them about what God intends to do in the future and that God has already unleashed forces into history to turn things around. And so he speaks in anticipation of what in fact is yet to come. And you see, that is precisely the place that we are in this Advent season. And in fact, in every Advent season, there is at its heart a kind of agony that is a part of Advent. Because we do live in an extraordinarily troubled world. The world can be dark. Evil things occur. Life can be not just bad, but really quite frightening and terrible. And we understand that. We're not immune to it. But we also know, and here's the reason for the agony, we know that this is not as things will always be. That there is a part of us that even in the midst of the difficulty, knows that injustice is wrong. And that what's being done is, in fact, profoundly, it's a crime, but more than a crime, it's a horror show. And, and that there is something inside of us that, that this is not the way we are supposed to be treating one another. This is not the way the world was meant to be. The very fact that we say those things, the very fact that we ask the why question, is evidence in and of itself that we know that there is a different intention about this planet. In other words, it points to the fact that what God has placed within us is this sense that there is something else that ought to be, not the thing that we see. Whether you want to call it a longing for Eden, or I think more appropriate to the Advent season, those extraordinary passages, like in Isaiah, where he describes a different kind of world, where the wolf lies down with the lamb, where the child plays over the hole of the adder, a poisonous snake. In other words, we know deep within us that a part of the agony of this Advent season is that things are not right and we don't. And not only are they not right, but that we long, long for God to come. For, his, for the return of his son and to establish the new heaven and the new earth for which our heart cries, especially in the times of these tragedies. So there is, you see, on the one hand, an agony that is entirely appropriate to this season of Advent. It's something that we always feel and know, but the church liturgically holds us up and says, my brothers and sisters, this is normal for us to live as if we're caught between the longings of our heart and the reality of what we see in our circumstances. But there's something other more than that. It's not merely agony and longing. It is, in fact, a call to encouragement. 
It is a call to say, we know that things are not always going to be this way. And therefore, even in the midst of our difficulty, we can do the very thing that Paul asks of us. In the Philippian lesson, rejoice in the Lord, not rejoicing over evil. No, no. <coughs> but instead rejoicing that in the midst of real atrocity, we know that God has in fact not abandoned us. <coughs> And that we can face even the worst of circumstances in the very grace and strength of his presence. You see, Paul writes these extraordinary letters, not in some kind of Pollyanna retreat center on the side of the Mediterranean. Paul is writing these letters from a jail cell in Rome, knowing that he is facing certain, certain martyrdom in the arena. He knows he is going to die a horrific death. I don't know whether you, if you knew that you would be torn to pieces by wild beasts or some other fantastically horrible death, could write to your fellow Christians, rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I say rejoice, but that's because Paul knew that even the horrific death that he would endure was not going to be the end, that it would in fact be for him the gateway into eternity, that he would finally receive the very inheritance that God had given him, where that, in that place where, as it says in Revelation, there is no pain, there is no grief, where God wipes away every tear from every eye. Because he knew that was his destination, his final resting place. Not the ground, or even strewn on the floor of the arena. He could, even in that jail cell, said, commend his fellow Christians who are suffering persecution for their faith. Rejoice. I say rejoice. And the promise that in everything that you're enduring, that's the very time to turn to God. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the promise that even in the worst of circumstances, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard, in other words, literally protect, protect your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. But, and lastly, this that we commemorate and proclaim is not meant merely to be the promise of the future, the peace that we can know now because we belong to him and he will never let us go. But it is also meant, in fact, to be a call to action. Because you see, if we know that we are his and that he will never let us go, and regardless of what we face in life, we will always face that in his presence. He will be the one, as the scripture says, in him we move, move and have our being. That we can, in fact, go into the most difficult places where people are profoundly suffering and not be overwhelmed by the suffering, but be able to serve in it. This morning when I got up really early, one of the first things that I did was I texted three clergy I knew up in the northeastern area who I suspected would be involved in ministering to people involved in that tragedy. And sure enough, I heard from two of them who said to me, oh, I was there in Newtown just Friday. Or another one who said to me, yes, we know people who are in that school and we held a prayer vigil on Friday night. He said, you know, it's like 9-11, only worse. And they were there and I knew they would be. Because they know the courage of what this peace and this power can bring to you. And in the midst of people who are in agony, who literally have no answer and no way to turn, they could, in those situations, walk Weep with those who weep, stand beside them, know that they are not alone, and pray for God's mercy and grace to reach them. Now, I have to tell you, that takes courage. <coughs> that takes courage. But they had it because they knew the very things that Paul was describing in the Philippian letter. That is why when the people come to John the Baptist, and in the midst of his call to repentance and God pouring out his spirit, they say, what are we to do? And notice what he gives them. He gives them, in fact, very clear action items. What are we to do? He says, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. 
And whoever has food must do likewise. Even the tax collectors, what should we do? Collect no more than the amount prescribed. Soldiers, what are we to do? Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusations. In other words, what he's saying to them is, you live in divine appointment. God has chosen you specifically, poured out his life upon you, not just so that you can feel better about yourself, not just so that you can have a happier family life and that you can be, be at peace inside, although all of that is in fact true and promised, but that so that you could in a new way choose to be God's servant and be available for him so that you have the freedom to give generously, financially generously, to share your food with the hungry, to stand with those who are in profound difficulty, and know that in those places you can be there in and surrounded by the very presence of God. In other words, Advent is not merely a call to both face difficulty and know that we're at peace in the midst of it because there's something better yet to come. It is also a call to action. And to say, here am I, send me. So that it is extraordinarily appropriate that in the Advent season, this group of dear people are being presented for confirmation and reception because they're making action item commitments to Christ. And you also, in reaffirming your baptismal vows, will reaffirm those same action item commitments because God assumes by these commitments that you're not just willing to receive and feel better, you're willing to receive and go into the places that God sends you, wherever that might be. So today, in the midst of profound tragedy, we worship a God who knows by experience in the crucifixion of His Son what profound tragedy is like. We hear from authors who write in the midst of extraordinary political occupation, the sentence of death, calling us in our generation to take our place with them and to both receive all that God has to pour out upon us and to say, yes, we will seek and serve even as our baptism declares to us and even as we have promised. Because in a world that is terrifying, in the midst of all that they endure, God has given us a great and precious gift. And through our presence, through our finances, through our volunteerism, through our being open to God to use us wherever we are, He calls us to open wide our hands and to give the very deep and wondrous things that He has given to us. And in, even in this service, as we act this out again, we say, yes. Or, how can we do anything less? Let us pray again. Gracious Lord, I do thank you that we are yours. And that you promise, no matter what it is that we have to endure, that you will always be present and that you will never let us go. In the midst of a world that is not as it was intended, we thank you that you are bringing forth a new world. And that in the return of your Son, for which we long, we thank you that a new heaven and a new earth is coming. And that you have placed that promise in us, as those who belong to you. So, O oh God, in this Sunday of Advent, help us to hear those promises again. And say yes to you, both for the calming of our fears and for the commitment to serve. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord that we pray. Amen.